I want to talk to you further about the mysteries as they are hinted at and suggested through the narrative of the book of Acts. But I want to start with a little different thing. And the reason that I do is because of those mysteries. In other words, if we, if we count, if we do the standard, and you can do this any way you want to, but if we do the standard dispensational isms, you got from Adam to Noah, and you got from Noah to Abraham, and you got from Abraham to Moses, and then you come all the way over here, and there's a dispensation of, uh, I'm going to say, dispensation of promise in here between the ministry of Christ beginning and the uh, end of the book of Acts. And so you got one, two, three, four, five, us, grace, as six, the continuation of this one over here with Christ coming down, the continuation of this one right over here for seven years, and then you've got the thousand years. So basically you count this and this as one. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now it's all right with me if there's ten dispensations. You know what I mean? I, I don't care if there's 10. I once did a chart showing 14. Just the way the Lord dealt with men differently, that's all it was. But nevertheless, it is a manner in which dispensing the Lord's will and the Lord's word and the Lord's activity is put out. That's what makes up a dispensation. So I come up with a chart that said 14. I never published that. I never tried to make a big deal out of it because I didn't see any worth to it. It isn't that I didn't think I was right to see those things. But you see, through prayer and the supplication of the Lord and all of that, what I noticed was that if I mentioned one of those outside these seven, then I was going to have to um, uh, take a stand. Well, I wasn't going to stand on something that didn't matter. In other words, if it's one thing to, to believe in a form of doctrine that is that becomes a part of what you are but if it doesn't matter to anybody in the long run such as how many dispensations there are why would you want to make a big deal out of it why do you want to set yourself apart now I want to talk to you about three people in the Bible here to start with that are the prime example of what not to do in service to the Lord so I want you to turn to the book of Jude yep Jude the one page book of Jude right in front of the book of Revelation. Oh, Charles and Lavelle, I'm sorry. I, I keep trying to make it as clear as I can. I, th I think when I, sometimes when I talk, it's only clear to people like me. So I apologize for that. No, I was on last night, but I will not be on next Tuesday night, okay? Jude, verse 3. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now why would he, as it were seemingly, change his mind about what he was going to write about? Here's why. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I'm not trying to relate anyone in today's world into these men. But you see, there's a thing that's always present in our world. We'll get back to it in a moment. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in, my, in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, and after, uh, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Wow. Wow. Read about how he did it. There was 24,000 once, there was 20,000 once, and there was 14,700 once. Whoa. Oh, the 14,700 was besides the leaders. Verse 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, I don't believe that an everlasting chain is made from an iron link. The elements are going to burn with a fervent heat, so they're not everlasting. 
So I would suggest to you that that's not anything of a worldly or earthly nature there. The everlasting chains. I also then would further suggest that it being a spiritual issue, that darkness in the passage is ignorance. They are in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. They're not ignorant in the sense that, they're, that they've never been told. They're ignorant in the sense that they made a decision to ignore that which was before them. The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. God has reserved them in everlasting chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Keep reading. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after a strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers, these filthy dreamers, because of the pronoun these, it has to go back to the certain men of verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares. Jude's writing this. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, no doubt. Jude is writing this. For there are certain men crept in unawares, verse um, uh, 8, Likewise also these, fil these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, don't you think about those three things. They defile the flesh. Defile the flesh. They despise dominion. If they despise dominion, who is their boss? Nobody. And speak evil of dignities. What is a dignity? The testimony of our Lord and Paul his prisoner are two of the greatest dignities to be in our world. How about if it was people who speak evil of the testimony of our Lord and Paul his prisoner? Keep reading. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. In other words, what did Michael do to gain what the Lord sent him after, Moses' body? He turned the devil over to the Lord and said, The Lord rebuked thee. Now, it isn't that I don't want to take a stand and, and, uh, and build a defense against the things that are going wrong or that are evil in this world or that, that come to pass uh, despite the, the pure and simple Word of God. I, I want to take that stand against them, so I'm not, I'm not copping out when I say this. But this is what I know. If Michael the archangel disputed with the devil and turned him over to the Word of the Lord, the Lord rebuked thee, so will I. Those that come against the teaching of the Word of God, in rightly dividing the Word of Truth, in laying out the dispensational truth of the Word of God, those that come against that, those that would argue the, the nitpicky little points until they've ground away and driven people away from hearing the Word of God, and it happens all the time, I'm going to stand up against, but I'm going to rebuke them with the Word of the Lord. The Lord rebuked them, not Jerry. Okay, keep reading. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know, naturally, as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. And folks, they do. I'm not trying to put flesh on display here, but I want you to remember that the first thing these filthy dreamers do is defile the flesh. Well, what would it mean to defile the flesh in our world, in, in the world of, of, let's say, the world of Bible doctrine? How would you defile the flesh? To defile something is to call it something that it is not. It is to make out things about a thing that make that thing appear worse to other people. To defile the flesh 
is in effect to act like you're stronger than other flesh. Instead of minding Paul when he said that you ought not to think of man above that which he seemeth to be. And uh, not to speak, not, not, to, not to think of, of yourself higher than what you actually are. And not to glorify men or exalt man, nor to take away from something that a man has, honor to honor is due, and on and on, that sort of thing. And notice, if you will, there's and the scripture, all the scriptures to back this up. Notice, if you will, there's another thing that takes place here. It says, as what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. What they know naturally. Not what they know spiritually. What they know naturally. These who speak evil of those things which they know not. And they're out there. In fact, they're driven to be there. They really are driven to be there. Look, if you will, in verse uh, 11. Here's the three. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, that would be Abel's brother, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. And you can read all about Korah in Numbers chapter 16, and it's K-O-R-A-H in the Old Testament, C-O-R-E here. Here's the deal about Korah. Him and two other guys decided that Moses ought not to be so, such an exalted leader. Look back up at uh, the last line of verse, uh, next to the last line of verse 8, despise dominion. They despise dominion. So when Korah and his two friends despised the dominion, they said, well, we don't think you ought to do this. You take too much on yourself, blah, 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 blah. Moses said, well, let's find out what the Lord says about it. And the end result is that, that Korah and Abiram and I uh, forget the other guy's name, Dothan, Dathan, Dathan, not Dothan, Dathan, they all perished. The ground just kind of opened up and swallowed them. Why? Because they stood up against the Lord's anointed. They would not relent. Uh, uh, Byram and Dathan, they wouldn't come down to where Korah went to meet Moses. So Moses said, tell you what let's do, let's just go see them. And he went down there and they stood in their doors with their wives and their children and all of their possessions were all behind them and, and, they, and the ground just opened up and swallowed them. So he says, these people, these, these, ah, these certain men crept in unawares. They're right here, right now, in the world we live in. They are filthy dreamers. They dream about themselves and the, and the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, adulation that they believe they, uh, they have coming to them. They defile the flesh. They despise dominion. They speak evil of dignities. They speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally instead of spiritually as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves and they run in the way of Cain and Balaam and Korah. Now in the case of Balaam, Balaam was some kind of a priest. Who knows? And so Balak, a little king, he said, I want these people of Israel cursed. So he says, I'll tell you what you do. If you curse them for me, you being a priest, well then I'll give you great riches. A reward. Balaam ran greedily after the error of reward. So when this occurred, the Lord wouldn't let him curse them. So Balak doubled it up or whatever. He added more to the booty. And he still wouldn't let Balaam curse Israel. And so, now I'm shortening about eight chapters in your Bible to say this, but as it turned out, Balaam knew something that men in Israel wanted. 
So he taught them how to get it. And it was a defiling of the Word of God in the lives of their families. And Balaam died by the sword at the appointed time. Cain, on the other hand, just simply started a works religion. He took of the fruit that he had grown and tried to get the Lord to honor and bless it when it is very obvious from the get-go, from the time of Adam and Eve in the garden and the original sin, it is very obvious that the sacrifice that was necessary was not the work of one's hands, but rather it was the innocent blood. And Abel brought the innocent blood and his sacrifice was acceptable unto the Lord. Cain brought the work of his hands, which was not acceptable unto the Lord. So they have gone in the way of Cain. They're trying to get their own works to give them something. See, see the bright shiny star in my forehead? Look what I have written. Look what I have said. I have fought these fights. I have gone here. I've built these charts. I've made a great website. I've got people that believe me. I'm just as good as anybody else is. I'm better than most because I can see more scripture. And on and on it goes. Folks, forget all of that nonsense. It is the way of Cain. It is the way of Balaam. And it is the way of Korah. For several years, before I left Texas, my great worry was that people would quit honoring the, the Word of the Lord when I left. That was really stupid and foolish of me. You know why? I didn't have anything to do with their belief in the Word of God. Oh, I know people say, well, he showed us a lot. Well, praise the Lord, I could show you something. But the Word was there all along. He didn't need me. I was always reminded of Brother Moore's statement to a bunch of young preachers one time, about half of which are still preaching, the other half of who knows where. He said, all you really need is a King James Bible, a Strong's Concordance, and an 1828 Dictionary of the English Language. Then he said, you really don't need that dictionary. Then he said, you really don't need a Strong's Concordance. All you really need is the King James Bible. Well, I tried to get that point across, not because I didn't want people to like me or come hear me preach, but because it wasn't up to me to be what they wanted or needed me to be. It was what the Word of the Lord said to them that mattered. It isn't about me, and I praise God that four men besides me, I mean after I'm gone, four men in Texas preach now that were not preaching before. Four men. I'm not bragging. I'm saying they didn't need me, and I told them all along they didn't need me, but nevertheless what I'm saying is, since they didn't need me, they've proven it by opening up the Word of God, seeing what the Lord would have them to do and say, and getting on with it. And I don't take any credit for that one bit. It's all about the Lord, not about me. And if you say Jerry did a good work out there, I'm going to throw a brick at you. I'm trying to get you to understand it's about the word of the Lord. It's not about a man. No one had any more respect for his teacher than I did Brother Reese Moore. But I know what caused all of us who, took, who come out of Brother Moore's classes and started preaching. I know what made us preach, and it wasn't Brother Moore. And it's never been me. But that's not the way it is in our world, you understand. There are doctrines that people teach and they propagate that by getting other people to teach that same doctrine. They do. I think it's a great thing that a congregation of people, whether it be 20 or 30 or 50 or 80 or 100 or 400, I think it's a great thing that men will stand up and say to the pastor of that group, uh, I'd, I'd like to teach a Bible class. And he says, okay, well, have at it. And he gives them the pulpit and they teach. I think that's a great thing. But it's, that's not about what his ministry is. I think he's supposed to teach others who will teach others also, as 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says. But whether or not they all stand up and speak, or whether or not they all sit there and say amen, 
and then support him in the ministry. That's neither here nor there. I like to see people stand up and start preaching at varying ages and with a varying amount of uh, time spent in the Word of God until they can learn and say the right things and do the right things where the gospel of Christ is concerned and always speak as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I love for that to happen out of a congregation, but if it doesn't, it's all right with me. But is it all right with that preacher who is their leader? Or should there have been an emphasis somewhere else? Should there have been something else that he put forward? Now, all I'm trying to get you to understand, folks, is that there are enemies. Let's not make enemies out of people who take the stand for the Word of God that we believe is correct. But let's not side with people who have some of those things correct, but they've got these little uh, irritating little doctrines that make people upset, angry, or drive them away from an otherwise good Bible study. So well, what would you be talking about, Jerry? Look in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. Here's what I'm talking about. Verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. That's what I'm talking about. So I don't know who that is. You don't need to know who it is. You need to know what to be aware of. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's the picture of their attitude. Here's the picture of their, the composite of their problem. People who are taking heed to seducing spirits and unto doctrines of devils are defined right here in these first seven verses. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men, here we go, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That'd be number one. Covetous. They want something they don't have because somebody else had that and they thought they deserved it too. Boasters. They're always talking about their own accomplishments. They're proud. That is, they would never let anything get in the way of their position about themselves. They are blasphemers. They say things they ought not. Not necessarily blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but they say things, stand, stand and speak against things which they ought not stand and speak against. That's called blasphemy. Disobedient to parents. You'd have to check their background on that. Unthankful. Why would they be unthankful? Oh yeah, they didn't like their teachers or some such thing as that. Unholy. Unholy. Holy means separated. Unto the Lord, separated unto the Lord, set apart. If they're unholy, they're not set apart. Not that they don't go off by themselves. They go off by themselves until they get somebody to come with them. The next one is without natural affection. I don't know how to speak to that either. You'd have to get into their private life. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And that ain't necessarily about going out and getting drunk. There's lots of ways men have pleasures, and it causes them to it causes those the pleasures that they love cause it to show up that they don't really love the Lord. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Uh, I'm not saying they're denying the power of godliness. They're denying the form of godliness has a power from whence is other than the Lord. There's lots of powers in this world, you understand. The power of Satan is ridiculous in this world around us. And it's not hard to spot. Most time it's hard to admit to the power of Satan. So he says, he goes on and says, get away from them. From such turn away. From such turn away. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he said, those that suppose that gain is godliness, get away from them. Think about gain and godliness. If someone thinks that gain, whether it be in number or their stature, that is their financial stature or their uh, community stature, or the number of people listening to them, if they think that proves some form of godliness, they fail to read 1 Timothy chapter 5. Then keep reading here. If they have a form of godliness and, and they deny the power thereof and you are supposed to turn away from them, then what do you do then if you go become uh, complicit with them? If you join up with them? You take on a form of godliness of which the power is denied. Now verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Also a very difficult passage to, to teach about in this light. But I'll tell you this much. Silly women laden with sins are not led away with divers' lusts in the passage. The silly women laden with sins are led away by these men who started in verse 2 unto those divers' lusts, diverse, diverse lusts. Well, what do you mean by that? You don't need me to explain that. It's not always about sex, but it is a diverse lust. You know, uh, the first time I ever saw an old female evangelist on television, I thought everybody in there was going to pass out from the way they screamed and yelled and swooned over her. She had on this, she walked up this, stage that was on, built on an incline, slight incline, and she had this gown that was all filmy and all that sort of thing, and it just floated out to the sides of her body. And she just walked up there with the music playing and waving her hands and claiming great things in the name of some Lord. And everything that she said after she got up there, I mean, I didn't know very much about the Bible at the time, but I knew that was all wrong. And it reminded me, when I was a little boy, there was a woman in the system of churches that my dad was involved with, and my dad was against women preachers. But this woman claimed to be a preacher, and she got herself ordained by three members of some sort of a presbytery board in that denomination. I only saw her preach one time because my father, by the way, would not let her preach in any church he pastored. But we're at somebody else's church and she's preaching and she makes a signal kind of like this as she made one of her salient points and a, a man, I, I can't seem like it was her husband, he got up and went to the piano and he began to play a real boogie-woogie type of thing. And she began to sing. And she was singing this song about a rock that was hewn out of the mountainside. I don't know if you ever heard that song or not, but it's talking about the Word of God. And she made a dance with the Bible in her hand up and down across that, that uh, front of that church and jumped up and down off the pulpit enough that my father got a, us kids by the arm and took us out of there and we left and went home. Well, I didn't blame him. I thought it was all a great show, but it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with God. You know, I wasn't very old. I don't know, six or seven probably. But even I could tell that. That's good entertainment, but it, what does that have to do with God? Nothing. So all I'm trying to get you to see is diver's lust is a strange and wondrous term here. And diver's lust is not always about what silly women might do with men privately. Not about that. These men, it says, creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. So, well, that's not, and nobody I know, mm, well, you, you may not know. 
Now notice, the last verse tells it all. Verse 7. Not the last of the chapter, but the last in this, these seven. It says, These men, verse 2, men shall be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They need some new thing. They need one more point. I believe if we did this on our chart, we could get this scripture to fit right in there. In other words, not saying, I believe I could make a chart that shows what this scripture says. They don't do it that way. Now, Look, if you will, in Romans 16, and you may by now be wondering what this has got to do with revealed mysteries, and I hope I can show you. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Oh, wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. In other words, about the evil things that would come your way, be simple about them. You needn't embrace these evil things. You needn't toss these evil things out on their ear. You just simply don't get involved. You let those kinds of things be harmless to you. Notice he says, Your obedience is come abroad. I would have you wise unto that which is good. In fact, you find a passage that says, Hold fast that which is good. I find another one that says, cleave unto that which is good. In other words, what do you do with that which is good? You embrace it above all else. Your life that you're leading in the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding under the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So bear in mind, not like these who would mark, uh, who would cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, which is according to Paul's writings here. No, no, you avoid them <coughs> and don't follow their good words and fair speeches. Rather, follow the word of the Lord. Go to Philippians chapter three, Philippians three. in verse 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect Philippians 3 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if in anything you be otherwise minded God shall reveal even this how's God going to reveal things unto you through his written word what do you need for that? You need an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher, but you need the Word of God. I get somewhat disturbed about overhead projectors for that reason. I, I like overhead projectors. I really kind of like them for the music, even though in, uh, in 7-Eleven music they're worthless. I mean, you say the same thing over and over and over, so you don't need overhead projectors for that. But I don't mind having projected music up on the wall. I can read, you know. Most of us don't sing songs because we read the music in the staffs as we read the verse. We just sing because we know the song. What we need to be reminded of is words and phrases that the poet who was inspired by the Lord, if it's a godly song, like a preacher is inspired by the Lord, that the poet put in there, that song should be read or should be sung the way the poet wrote it. Nevertheless, he says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Wait for the Lord to reveal unto you things that are coming to you from some teaching process 
wherein the word of the Lord is not that which backs it up. In other words, if a guy shows you a verse of Scripture and says, this proves this right here on my timeline, then you better find another Scripture to back that up. <laughs> Notice verse 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an example. Now watch this parenthesis. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. These would be people who would be teaching something contrary to, to the doctrine which the Apostle Paul has laid out in Romans through Philemon. As Romans 17, uh, 16 verse 17 said. Here he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, watch, who mind earthly things. Earthly things. In other words, their mind. They, it says who mind. Mind is a verb there. They mind earthly things. What do they do when they are minding earthly things? They seek after that which is glorification in the earth. That is, as, as we live in this life. They're looking for, it's like uh, the Lord said about the Pharisees who walk proudly down the streets. says they've got their reward. People think they're great. Well, that's earthly things, as an example. You know, I think that the amount of money that is paid to sports stars all, uh, in every sport and Hollywood stars, every Hollywood there is, Bollywood, Hollywood, all of them, the amount of money that they are paid is atrocious for the work that they do. But it's a demand. In other words, the public demands their presence, so the public looks for them, so the people who have uh, an in with them and can get them to do things pay them big money to get them to do it because they know they're going to get the public to pay even more money. So that seems fair to me, even though I don't like it. It's atrocious. I mean, why in the world would a baseball pitcher, 30 years old, get a contract for $184 million? Imagine that. Well, they do stuff like that all the time. They do it in every sport. Now, what I'm trying to get you to understand is this. What about if it's a preacher? So people say, well, well, he may get $40 million a year, but at least he don't take it out of the congregation's coffers. No, probably not. Usually when a preacher gets to that status, he has written books or he gets special invitations to go somewhere else and speak to the tune of way great big um, honorariums and so forth. And his book sells so many million copies that he makes all this money. And so he proudly lets it be known through the system that he has put together that the congregation money is taken up in collections, goes for the ministry and not to the preacher for a salary. I think that's commendable, but I don't think that's commendable if you tell people about it. I think telling people about it just tries to put on some sort of false humility. Especially if you've got $40 million coming in from somewhere else. Is he worth $40 million? No. Should we take it away from him? Nope. We're living under grace. But honor him for it? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, when we were out, a few weeks ago, we were out in western Tennessee, and we heard um, John Osteen preach. I really enjoy John's sermon. I hope John shows up the next conference you go to, because you'll really like him. Uh, he's good, he's young, he's energetic, he's excited, and he's, um, he's a very good preacher. Now, he's not related to Joel Osteen. He's not related at all. But what he kept referring to is... Joel as his wayward cousin. I thought that was very funny. But John, uh, at the opposite end of the, uh, of the uh, economic spectrum of Joel, 
John works, uh, by, he does his ministry by faith. He has another job, but he spends a lot of his time in a camp that they put on a children's Christian camp for rightly dividing the word of truth. And you'll hear more about that as time goes on, I'm sure. It's, it's in uh, the southern Virginia, right across the uh, Tennessee line, not far from Tennessee. And I can't remember the details about that, but you can, look, you can find out about John's camp there. Now, my point is that John's got the name, see, John Osteen. Imagine John trying to capitalize on Joel Osteen's name. There's another young uh, uh, preacher uh, who has been showing the church that he pastors. He's been showing them rightly dividing, and they've taken down their denominational name. And I praise God for that. And his, his last name is Osteen, also not related to Joel, and also not related to John. And so there's these Osteen boys. What if they all, what if the other two, the young ones there, what if they tried to get on old Joel's coattails and ride his name to fame and fortune? Well, that would be the kind of thing that would fit into the way these certain men crept in underwears that Jude was talking about would do. So again, you're probably asking, why am I bringing all this up? Look back one more scripture about it, and then I'll, I'll get on with what I came here to do. Is it time to first start Bible class yet? Almost. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For a long time, I had a hard time understanding why this verse is here in the middle of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not sure I can tell you now all that I understand about this verse, but I do now. I believe I know why the Lord put it right here in this verse, uh, right here in this chapter. This chapter is about resurrection. It includes the gospel of Christ and the proof positive that Christ was raised from the dead and the hope because of Christ being raised from the dead. Right in the middle of it all, it says in verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Hmm. It really does say that. Notice, he says in verse um, 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. How does he protest by their rejoicing? He knows of their rejoicing and he stands there with them as an example of rejoicing in Christ Jesus so that he protests against those who say there is no resurrection. Keep reading. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage of it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Then he says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. You know what the evil, corrupt, uh, evil, evil communications is in the passage? Look back in verse uh, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? There's the evil communications, and it corrupts good manners. How does it corrupt good manners? What's the Lord mean it corrupts good manners? Evil communication puts an attitude on the people to keep them from understanding what they need to be saying instead of the evil communication. And so they put up their dukes they, or they back away and they get all huffy and puffy and they get away from the truth of God's Word instead of clinging to the truth of God's Word. Who starts all this stuff? Oh yeah, it's doctrines of devils. Look, if you will, in the book of Acts. Look in Acts chapter 15. Acts 15. We talked, last time we were talking about this, the way mysteries are unfolded, un, un, are revealed, and, or uh, hinted at, or whatever, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 15, notice verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren. This would be the brethren at Antioch in uh, Syria, by the way. 
and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, we know from reading Romans to Philemon, which is written after this, but also from reading Acts chapter 13, which we did last time. We know that Paul can't stand this. He's not going to put up with this. It says, verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, which means it was a big argument, no small, not small, no small dissension and disputation with them, Paul and Barnabas did. Hold on to Acts 15 and go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. In Galatians 1, He says in verse, um, I don't know how to do this except to start where I want to start, so just verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you've received, let him be accursed. Well, that would, fit first, that would fit Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, would it not? Except you be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Then they're preaching another gospel. And Paul says, let them be accursed. He did. Well, keep reading. Then he says, verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? If any, uh, uh, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men... I should not be the servant of Christ. In other words, if you, if you tear that down, unquestion uh, it, make it a statement, I cannot persuade God. I, it's not my intention to persuade men. I do seek to please God instead of pleasing men. And if I don't please God, how could I call myself a servant of Christ and not do the things that pleases Him? So, he follows this up real quickly. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now notice, chapter 2, verse 1. He says no more about the distractors in chapter 1. He said all he needed to say in verse 6 through uh, 10. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, meaning the Lord told him to go, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But, and that, which that means the people in Jerusalem did not know what he was preaching but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. He's not talking about whether he'd been wrong. He's talking about his going up there and making an issue out of this, whether that was uh, in vain or not. Verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares. Aha! False brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately, to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now in your mind, just go over to chapter 5, verse 1. No need to turn there. You know it by heart, right? Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, where did this issue start? I mean, come on, you know from good grace preachers you've heard for 25, 35, 40 years, ever how long you've been hearing the grace truth? You know good and well that grace preachers who preach the truth of the gospel of Christ and who preach the truth of rightly dividing the word of truth and, and, and holding to that which is good and, and letting go of that which is evil and on and on and on, you know from those men's teaching that the same thing that we've just read about here is happening today. Well, it was happening in Acts chapter 15. So what's going to settle the issue in Acts 15? Are we going to ferret out all those evil men and stomp them into the ground? 
Are we going to put them out of the assembly in Jerusalem? Nope. We're going to stand for the truth. Chapter 2 here, verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. What did Paul do? He went up there and told them the truth. He told them the truth. Did he say, I'll get you? No, he never said, I'll get you. Did he say, I'm going to win this argument? Not that we know of. He just went up there and he communicated unto them that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. Communicated evil communications. Corrupt good manners. Well, then what's good communication do? It builds good manners. I don't think, you can go back to Acts 15 now. I don't think that I'm probably talking to anyone who believes that Paul went to Jerusalem and convinced everybody in Jerusalem to change their mind about what they were preaching. I don't think I'm talking to anybody that believes that. But what I do know is that what Paul did when he communicated that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles is that he took their steam out. It was good communication and there was no bad manners. Acts chapter 15, after Peter says what he says, Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. Wow! I don't know whether that was 12 words, 1,200 words, or 12,000 words that Paul spoke there, but I know that what he did was declared what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. He said nothing that would have torn down whatever it was that was going on in Jerusalem. Wasn't his job going there and tear things down. Notice back in verse um, uh, 4. And when, they, when Paul and Barnabas were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Now, if you're standing there and you're Paul, and you know these guys are contrary to your doctrine, and you know that you're not, you cannot put up with that. You can't have them coming to where you are and saying wrong doctrine, as in you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. But you know by where they are and who they are that they were Pharisees that believed. So Paul lets it all unfold. Remember, he's already told them all things that God had done with him and Barnabas. So, verse 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, does not say Paul was doing the, dispute, did the, the disputing. You ought not to read that in. You say, well, I believe it was. Well, go ahead and believe that, but don't you declare it to be gospel or don't you declare it to be uh, a Bible truth because the Bible doesn't say Paul did the disputing. So, well, who did it? What do you care? It's neither here nor there. Paul went up there to explain to them, communicated unto them that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. And he would not, if we, we didn't read one verse shy there in Galatians 2, but he did not put up with them for any longer than he had to. And it, just sounds, it indicates a few minutes. But notice who the next speaker is. It's Peter. Verse 7, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. Peter says the things that he says, which people love to make big long stories out of that instead of just taking what it says as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it, remembering how Peter wrote the doctrine in his two books. And then when that's over with, when Peter says all he's going to say, the problem was diffused. Then they asked Barnabas and Paul, they gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, 
declaring the miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And they sent them on their way with a simple um, edict from the group of four simple things that Paul laid upon the people who turned to the Lord Jesus Christ after he left there. Now I went through Korah, Cain, Balaam. I talked about the evil men and seducers. Talked about the, the men of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and the men who follow uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And those who would speak evil communications. I talked about all of those people. And you don't have to run, a, run around trying to find them. You speak the word of God in truth and they'll find you. I'll never forget walking into a situation one day. I thought it was nice, going to be a nice friendly atmosphere. And this man says, So, you believe in chopping up the Bible, do you? Took me totally by surprise. I didn't have any idea anybody thought that that's what you did when you rightly divided the word of truth. I'm sure I made a mess of ever how I answered him. Because he took me, I mean, talk about being blindsided. I never expected that at all. And I did not know how to answer him. And I'm sure I made a mess of it. But there he sat there with this little sneer on his face. He had this great superior attitude. I wish I could mock it just so you'd know what I mean. I can't possibly do that. But he thought he was so much smarter. And that particular day, he was. He quoted things that wasn't even anywhere near Scripture. Contrary to the truth of God's Word, I wasn't smart enough to handle him. I was too much of a novice. And it looked to me like, about ten minutes into that thing, that I had inadvertently stepped into his bailiwick. If you know what I mean. I'm sitting there where he's king. I didn't like that, so I got out of there. All I'm trying to get you to see, folks, is that these people, you don't have to find them. You preach God's word. You say the right things about God's word. You speak the truth to your neighbor. They'll all find you. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not about doing good works for good rewards. You can trust the Lord about all that. It's about studying to show yourself approved unto God when you do do the work. When you speak up and say the right things. You don't have to find the fight. You don't want the fight. But the fight will find you. The book of Acts. Paul never told the people in Jerusalem any mystery except to tell them the gospel which he preached. And he did do that because Galatians chapter 2 backs up the fact that that's what he did. When he told, when he and Barnabas told what God had done with them, as in verse 4, then what Galatians 2 verse 2 bears out is that what he told was the gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. End result, they shake hands, the right hand of fellowship, they, they love the brethren, and they went their way and did their ministry. Was it wrong for him to go? Absolutely not. He went by revelation. Could he have done a better job? Absolutely not. The Lord led. But here's the thing. The people in Jerusalem who were wrong, we have no idea whether they stayed wrong or not. We don't know who they were. We have no business trying to invent something about that. But the Lord handled it the way the Lord wanted it handled. And when Paul left Jerusalem, Silas, who had been one of the people in Jerusalem, Silas stayed with Paul from then on in his ministry. So well then he won. No, he didn't win. The Lord won. The Lord's word that separates in this, that comes through this time frame here at the end of this dispensation and coming into the grace dispensation, the Lord's word had to win, not the man. Paul and Barnabas didn't win. The Lord won. Look in Titus chapter 1. Titus 1. I've got one minute left here, folks. Titus 1.
He says of men who are going to go preach and teach and, and st take a stand for the Lord in their lives, he says that verse 9, that they should be holding fast the faithful word as they've been taught, that he, might, that, he may be, ah, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, today we could say religion, get that right picture, whose mouths must be stopped. How do you stop their mouths? You show the truth of God's Word. And you let the Lord handle stopping their mouths. You don't win arguments. You show the truth of God's Word. As Paul did for the next 13 chapters in the book of Acts, Paul is showing God's Word everywhere he goes. I hope you get something from this kind of a lesson. I hope it's been helpful to you. Really appreciate you all being here and uh, glad to see the name.